before we get started, we want to have a commissioning of our Vacation Bible School workers. So if you have anything to do this week with Vacation Bible School, I need to see you right down front, front and center right now. So everybody, come on, all the VBS workers. You can be working in the kitchen, you can be a teacher, you can be a floor sweeper, you can be a a, 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 a parking lot guard or whatever it is that you are. Come on down here. We want to pray for you. That's it. Come on down. Because we know that you're going to have a rough week this week. <laughs> but it is going to be worth it. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. This is like sending the lambs off to the slaughter, isn't it? You know, <laughs> Jesus sent his 72 out and he told them to get ready. And they came back all excited because of all the things that had happened. And we're sending y'all out to, to go work this week. And they're going to be, there are young people who today, do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but because of what you guys are going to do this week, those kids are going to come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And I bet you that there are some adults who will be on the fringes watching things, and they're going to come to know who Christ is as well. And we may or may not know about that when it takes place. So because of that, we want to pray for each one of you tonight. So I'm going to lift up one prayer out loud. But as I am praying, I'm going to ask for all of you who are here tonight to silently be lifting up a prayer. Take a quick look across the group right here. I won't call every one of their names out uh, uh, one at a time because I'll never remember that name, many names at one time. But, but you look at them, you pick out two or three and you pray for those two or three specifically in your time of prayer. So let's pray together. Dear God in heaven, we thank you that you love our children at Ridgely. You love our community so much that you're going to send our people out into the highways and the hedges to bring these children in so that they can hear that God loved them so much that He gave His one and only Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now what I'm asking for is Your grace, God. I know that our workers have all been saved by grace. But I also know that they are empowered to do what they do by the grace that You settle inside of them. Would You grace them with the ability to accomplish the task that you've called them to accomplish today. Would you give them a supernatural ability through the power of your Holy Spirit and your grace to be able to communicate the truth of salvation and what it means to walk in the way that Jesus has called people to walk to these children who are in the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade this week. Even to the kindergartners, God, may you communicate a truth to them that is bigger than something they can yet understand. Then I pray that you'd keep our kids safe. I pray that we don't lose any kids. I pray that nobody falls down and breaks anything or anything like that. But I pray that every teacher will have all the supplies and things that they need to have during the week. And then I pray that not only will these kids hear the gospel at day, and during the daytime, but when they go home, that they'll take what they've learned back to their kitchen tables. I pray that they'll take what they've heard back into the living rooms of their own houses and share with their mamas and daddies the simple truth of the gospel that you love so much that you demonstrated your love for us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God, bless those who are standing here tonight because they are going to be a blessing this week to the people that they come in contact with. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Thank y'all so much. Let's give that hand. I can give them a big hand, all right? I hope we got a picture of them with the camera because I want to bring them back next Sunday night and see what they look like. <laughs> or better yet, bring them back Friday afternoon about 1 o'clock and see what they look like. So, Go ahead and take your Bible out and let's turn back to where we left off. Let's go back to uh, the last part of verse uh, 23 and pick up with the last little section where it says, I, Paul, a minister, and go from there. And we're going to read through verse 29. We're going to see Paul's description of ministry. Now, this is not what every ministry looks like because, frankly, every ministry is a little bit different and every pastor is a little bit different. Every youth pastor, every children's director or teacher or pastor is, is a little bit different. Different because God gives people in different ways to be able to do different things. And what we're going to see in the text tonight is that, uh, uh, that God is using Paul in such a way we're going to be able to see how God is using him. Now, you have heard me say numerous times from, from right here that everybody who knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is a missionary, right? Some of us, we send out to uh, Honduras or Hawaii.
Hawaii or Nicaragua or to different uh, Romania or Africa or these places, even to North Mississippi and to other, other places. But everybody else who stays here is still a missionary. You're just a missionary to the people you come in contact with here every day. Some in the foreign country, some in America, some in our own backyard. But not everyone's call is exactly identical because we are totally different people. Each Christian's call will flow from their giftedness that God gives them to be able to do and accomplish. Uh, God's grace working inside of them enables them to do the particular ministry, the particular good works that God called them to do. In fact, if you're a born-again believer of Jesus Christ, God has called you into some type of ministry as a missionary, into some type of good works, and He is empowering you today so that you can do that tomorrow when you come in contact with those people tomorrow. Now, tonight's text is going to show us Paul's view of ministry. It's going to show you how he sees it because he's writing in this letter what he sees is he's writing back to the church. Now, my goal tonight is to help us not only see what Paul's picture of ministry is, I'm going to go ahead and share with you my picture of ministry and what ministry looks like to me. Did, how many of y'all in here have figured out I'm different? Uh, I'll take by the chuckles that every one of y'all believe that. Every minister is supposed to be different, and God sends them to different places to accomplish different things. I don't do the same things that all of the ministers you've ever known, all the pastors you've ever known in your past do, because I'm not gifted to do the things that they've done. God has gifted me to do other things. So at the end of the message, and after I give you what Paul's, what his call to ministry is, I want to kind of show you what God is using me, and I hope that that will encourage you to remind you that no matter what you're like, no matter who you are, no matter how God created you to be, He intends for you to use that to minister to the people that you come in contact with from day to day. So having said that, let's go back to the book of Colossians now, and let's pick up in the very last words of verse 23 in chapter 1. And it's going to see right there, it's going to say right there at the end, at the end of the sentence, it's going to say, I, Paul, became a minister. And then we go to verse 24. It says, now I rejoice... In my sufferings, for your sake, and in my flesh, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of his mystery, which is, in, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. And all of God's people said, And by the way, just in case you're wondering, that verse 29 is highlighted in about three different colors in my Bible because it is such a powerful verse that we'll talk about tonight. But there are some things about Paul's view of ministry I want us to look at right off the bat. The first thing I want you to see about Paul's ministry right off the bat is Paul's chief goal was to present as many people as possible to God complete in Christ. Paul's chief goal was to present as many people as he possibly could to Christ. In fact, he says everybody, he wants to present them before God, before Christ, mature in their faith. Now, one of my best friends in ministry that I have is uh, Wayne Hudson. How many of y'all know who Brother Wayne Hudson is? An awesome guy. And he has a ministry. There's a name to his evangelistic ministry, and the ministry is called Complete in Christ. And in many of your translations, when we get to that where it says mature in Christ, it says complete in Christ. This is, what, this is the text that he draws his whole ministry from because it has to do with the teaching of the Word of God and bringing people from where they are and getting them in ministry to where they need to be so they can accomplish what God has called them to accomplish. Now, Paul was a traveling missionary. He spent long periods of time. Sometimes he spent as much as two and three years in a place. Sometimes he was only there for a day or two. But we know through the book of Acts, he had three different missionary journeys. But his goal was not to make converts. 
Paul's goal was not to go and make converts of people. Rather, it was to find God's elect and bring them to be complete in Christ. Because God, Paul is, makes it understood that he understands that everyone is predestined according to the knowledge of God. And that God already knows who it is that's going to be saved. God picked Paul out, sent him out in ministry to go out and find, through evangelism, through telling the gospel to everybody they came in contact with about Jesus Christ, so that those individuals could come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, so that they could be developed, and then in ministry they could go out and minister themselves. So his job was to find a person who did not know Christ, introduce them to Christ and develop them to the point that they would, could, when they die, they would be able to stand complete in Christ uh, in, their, in, their, in their day of judgment. The second thing about Paul's ministry we he see here is Paul was empowered with grace. Every, would y'all say that part right there? Paul was empowered with grace. Now, what does that mean, Paul was empowered with grace? And I think this is the one thing that we Baptists do absolutely worst. As I listen to pastors in the Southern Baptist Convention, we do not make everybody understand the significance of grace. There are several types of grace. There is a grace that we, we are saved by the only way we know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is we've been saved by grace, not of any works that we have done, but because of the works that He has done. And we know that grace will carry us home, and it is that grace, not our works, that will get us into heaven. So we understand saving grace, and we understand the grace that makes us complete to be in Christ. But what I think we forget about is that grace that exists in the middle. God is empowering you to do whatever it is that he's called you to do. And it's by his grace he is working inside of you. Now look what the text said that we read just a minute ago. Paul says he is struggling with all his energy. He. Now the he there is not Paul's energy. It's the energy that God powerfully works within him. So it is by God's grace that has given Paul the ability to continue under the adverse circumstances that he has to be able to take, 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 take people, share with them what the Old Testament says, has to say and what in the world that has to do with the New Testament and Jesus Christ and them in particular as they mold it all together. He is able to use the giftedness that God has given him to be a teacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that people can understand how God is changing them on the inside and causing them to move from being a lost person to being a saved person to being the missionary that they're supposed to be to growing to spiritual maturity so that they can be used in different ways throughout their lives in ministry. Now Paul did what he did because God empowered him to do so. Paul was Paul because God made Paul Paul. Okay, can I say that again? Paul was Paul because God made Paul Paul. Okay, would y'all say that with me? No, I'm not going to make you do that. But I want you to listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. Paul writes these words when he's writing to the church in Corinth. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Paul was good at what he did because he worked hard at being good at what he did. But the only reason he could be good at what he did and the only reason he could work hard at what he did is because God has made him in such a way that he could work hard and be good at what it was that he did. His su success was not based on himself. His success was based on what God was doing inside of him from day to day. So whenever there's a little small voice in your mind that says, well, God, I can't do that. What you just said was to, to God was... God, you're crazy. You can't make me do that. And don't ever tell God that he can't make you do something. Because whatever God calls you to, he is going to equip you to accomplish. Now, I've also found that, well, let's, let's say uh, 
you know, I, at my age, I'm an old man now, so I like to sing, and I know that I can carry a tune if I have a bucket to carry the tune in. And one day when I was a young man singing, I was about 22 years old, and I was singing down at Escataba Baptist Church, and me and the piano player had worked this song up together, and I was supposed to step out and sing, and, and she gave this beautiful introduction to what I was supposed to sing, and we got right there, and I forgot every word in the song. And I mean, I said, well, can we try that again? She goes back. She said, big, beautiful introduction. And I go, and I turned around and just walked out of the building, you know? And I thought to myself, well, God, I don't know why you told me to sing because I couldn't even remember all the words of the song I was supposed to be. I am so embarrassed. But you know, over the next week or so, I had so many people who came to me and shared with me like stories are either how they could see how God was using me and developing me. And they began, what I, what I grew to know was, even when we mess up, God is using our mess ups in a purpose, in a way that we can't even understand. The reason I couldn't remember all that stuff was because I couldn't remember all that stuff. Because my brain wouldn't call it this. But who made me? God made me. Did God want me to sing that day? Absolutely God wanted me to. Well, actually, God didn't want me to sing that day, but he did want me to stand up there and not sing that day. All right? God, God is, is using you in ways that you can't imagine. Paul struggled with all his energy, and he worked out his salvation in fear and trembling. As he says, he wasn't fearing and trembling that he was going to lose his salvation. It was fear and trembling that maybe he was supposed to do more. It was fear and trembling that maybe he wasn't accomplishing the particular task that God had called him to accomplish. But he figured out from trial and error, through day and day, through reading the Word, through walking in the Spirit about God's working grace. And that's that grace that God works in you so that you can be the minister, the missionary that God has called you to be. Third part of Paul's ministry here is Paul sought to make the Word known. He wanted everybody to understand the Word like he could understand the Word because Paul, frankly, Paul understood the Old Testament probably better than anybody else he had gone to college with, probably better than anybody he had gone to the Jewish seminaries with. I mean, he knew that Word. He didn't know what it meant, but he knew that Word. He thought it meant what he thought it meant, but he came to find out that it meant something else. Uh, Paul was made uh, was uh, sought to make that Word known. As the Scripture said tonight, we read, it said to make the Word of God fully known so that people understand it. He desired to teach and to preach and to make known the riches of the Old Testament and the teachings that Jesus had given. Now what Paul had was he had this extreme amount of knowledge. It was in his head that he had learned about the Old Testament. But when the Holy Spirit comes inside of him and by God's grace that Holy Spirit begins to unlock his brain to be able to see scripture from a new perspective that he could not see before and begin to teach with a giftedness uh, that nobody else had in the time that Paul was there. And he began to share the gospel and share that teaching with the people, so much so that even when he was in prison, they would go back and write letters to him to try to clear up theological issues. And he would write back a letter to them that was so powerful, God has preserved those letters for us so that we can have them here today. Another thing about Paul's ministry, Paul was made a steward of the gospel. Now, this is one that kind of gets stuck in my crawl from time to time, so I'm, I may camp out on it a minute here. He, Paul was wanted to make the Word of God fully known. Now, here, at Paul, wanted, Paul was now made a steward of the gospel, and the text that tells us that is where it says, I became a minister according to the steward from God. I became a minister according to the stewardship from God. Okay, Paul did not choose to be a minister of Jesus Christ. Right? Did you, you hear what I said? Paul did not choose to be a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who chose Paul to be a minister? And how did he do that? He knocked Paul off his high horse, knocked him down on the ground, caused him to not be able to see and only hear the word of God. Paul did not choose that he would go out and be a teacher of the way. Paul did not choose God or ministry. He chose to persecute the way. He was on a mission to have as many Christians as he could be put to death. God chose Paul's ministry of reconciliation. You remember we talked about that reconciliation this morning, how we are here, well, God is here and we are here and we have to be reconciled to God. 
God so that we can walk in the way that He's called us to walk. Well, God called him into that. Now, often pe- people will say to pastors and to missionaries, and this is, this, if you ever want to make a pastor or a missionary really mad, I'm going to go ahead and tell you how to make them mad. You can look at them and you say, well, well, you chose this life that you are living. And I want you to know right up front, they did not choose the life which they are living. God chose the life which they are living. And God called them to do what they do. And it is God who empowers them to accomplish and do what they do. They did not choose it. God chose it. And sometimes all they have to hang on to is the call that God has sent them. I am sure there was a bunch of times when Paul would go pull back from preaching the gospel in a in synagogue where he was one day and say, well, I ain't going back down there again. And God would say, oh, yes, you are. You're going because I sent you down there. I know there's a many a preacher that's preached the message. I know there's many a preacher that's been in a, at a staff meeting of some kind or something, and they go back to their office and they'd say to themselves, I ain't going back down to that church no more. Them people don't like me, they don't love me, and I ain't ever going back. And I'll admit to you, I have been that person too. I've told you before five different times I read out, wrote out my resignation. First five years at Ridgely, every year, at least once a year, I wrote out my resignation. And I told God who I was going to give it to. And he'd say, you didn't call yourself to Ridgely. I called you to Ridgely. That's the same thing. A minister is a minister because God has called them to minister no matter what. Sometimes all that they have to hang on to is the fact that God has called them to do what they do. Another thing about Paul's ministry was Paul saw ministry as a joy even when it was difficult, even when it was painful, even when it hurt. Uh, Paul was beaten. Paul was stoned. Paul was robbed while he was traveling. Paul was shipwrecked on two different occasions. He was stoned not only on several occasions, but he was literally stoned to death till all the people thought that he was dead. And he stood up after everybody left and he walked away. Yet he writes in this letter that he's writing back to Colossus that uh, now I rejoice. But now notice he doesn't say, when I was stoned to death, I rejoiced because I was stoned to death. He's saying, now I rejoice. Because he realizes that every single thing that he's been through, he's been through for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the sum total of all the things that happened to him is what taught him with the Word of God, with the the Holy Spirit that was in him, how to communicate to the people that he came in contact with. When, you, when you're teaching the Word of God, whether it be to your grandchildren, whether it be your Sunday school class or to the uh, VBS class that you're going to teach to right now, don't be afraid to insert your personal illustrations in there into what you're teaching because you have been through what you've been through and God knew you were going to go through what you went through and He could have saved you from going through what you went through, but He allowed you to go through it because you wouldn't be who you are if you hadn't been through what you had been through. Now, once you go through that, you're just like Joseph. You're ready to be used in a new way before God. No great minister, no mighty warrior in the kingdom of God can be a mighty warrior in the kingdom of God until they've been broken by the circumstances of life. Usually those who have been broken most, like Paul, like Peter, like David, like John, like these guys who are broken the most, they are the ones who make the greatest ministers of all. He did not enjoy being stoned to death, but he enjoyed its effect on the gospel because it made his preaching that much more effective, that his teaching that much more effective. And then the last aspect that I think this text teaches us tonight, Paul was willing to suffer for the sake of God's people. Look what he, look what he said. My suffering is for Jesus' sake? No. He says, my suffering is for my sake? No. No. What is it? My suffering is for your sake. He loved his people so much that he was willing to suffer through all of these things so that he could be who God called him to be. Ministry cost Paul physically. 
Ministry cost Paul emotionally, but spiritually it gave him a joy that surpassed communication in any way. And ministry does that to people. Even those people who die in ministry. Paul was probably decapitated in Rome, yet as he's put to death, he has a joy within him because he was counted worthy to suffer for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was worthy to die in a manner that Jesus Christ died so that the gospel could be carried out to the outermost parts of the earth. So that brings me to my view of ministry. And I want, I want to tell you how my mind works and how God created me. And I'm just going to share with you those things that I think God has called me to do in ministry. And maybe you'll understand me better. And you, maybe you'll understand why I don't sit for hours in a hospital or why I don't go busting up in people's houses and, and all kinds of stuff. Because this, this is what I think God created in me to do. One is to teach the Word of God and to help under, others understand its significance in their own lives. You know, this Word of God is living and active and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And a long time ago, in my my early 20s, God began to show me the power of the Word and how when we live the Word in our lives, it makes our lives come together so that we can walk in the way that God wants us to walk. And I'm not brilliant by any means, but I am able to see that word, and most of you know that as we walk side by side through the things that we do, or as I teach from the pulpit, or as I teach in a Sunday school class, or as, as I teach in my office, when you come and ask me advice about things and I share with you what's in the Word of God, I'm able to help you see in God's Word things that you wouldn't have seen if you hadn't come and talked to me about what you saw in that Word. And I think God has uses me in a powerful way to be able to do that. So my number one goal in my life is to be equipped to use the gospel, to use the Word of God, so that you can have the information that you need to have whenever you and I go through the things that you go through in your life. The second thing that I think God has called me to do is to live out the Word of God in view of others. In other words, I believe, I believe very strongly that what I do speaks more loudly than what I say. You know, there's a lot of preachers that can preach beautiful messages, but they slip and fall in so many areas of their personal life. I personally believe that me walking the walk, and and when y'all know I fail so many times, but when I fail, I don't hide my failures from you. I go ahead, once my failures come, I show them to you how I have failed because I want you to know that as God's people, there will be times when you fail as well. But we expose our weaknesses because, as Paul says, in our weaknesses, it is Christ who is made strong in there. So many times we're able to do what we do, not because we're able to do it, but because God is showing up in us and he's showing out in us. So I try to live my, live my life according to the word of God so that you can see that. And the third thing is, and this is, this is tough, struggle with grace's work. In my life, I try to figure out what God's gifted me with being able to do and what God hasn't gifted me with being able to do. There are certain things I cannot do, and I've tried to be like other pastors and to look like them. And, you know, I would love to have one of those big, burning, burning sounding voices that just goes out and it sounds like God is speaking when they say, but y'all know when I say secret that I really mean secret. Y'all know when I say these redneck words that I learned from way back, y'all, I'll be preaching and I'll see y'all smile. I know why you're smiling because you heard what I said and I didn't even hear, I didn't even heard what I said, okay? Come back, tell me, no, it was not Moses who built the ark, it was Noah, you know? (laughs) And I think to myself, yes, they were listening. (laughs) You know, I can't be who I'm not. But I can be who God created me to be. So I'm going to be. And, and you know what I expect out of you? I expect you to be who God created you to be. You know, if, if you're funny, be funny. If you're serious, be serious. I'm serious about you being funny. No, I'm okay. I, be who God created you to be. The next thing is, not only do I struggle with the grace of who I'm supposed to be and figuring that grace thing out, I'm willing to suffer for and with others. You know, 
I think one of the one of the things that God has called me to do is is to to get in the trenches with you and to walk with you through things. And sometimes it costs me my health. Sometimes it it costs me different situations. Um, but I'm with, I, don't don't ever think that I mind doing that because that's what God created me to do. You know, I hate it when you call me at three o'clock in the morning. I'll be honest with you, but. I'm going at 3 o'clock in the morning when you call me. And then after I get there, after it's over with, we'll rejoice in what the Lord did at 3 o'clock in the morning, okay? And then the last thing is, I want to rejoice in ministry no matter what. You know I try to keep a smile on my face. You know I try to keep things light. I keep trying to help you understand that no matter what you come to, no matter what God has called you to, He's going to see you through, and He's going to cause you to be able to rejoice in all that God has done in your life. So that's why I do the things that I do. I close out with a couple of quick questions here, and this is the first question that I ask is, how can I, and, and when I ask this question, when I'm saying I here, I'm not talking about me. I want you to ask this question of yourself, okay? How can you become who God called you to be and effectively do what God has called you to do? Are there some changes that you need to make in your personal life right now so that you can fully be used by God in the way that God is calling you to be used? Maybe He's calling you to a new set of ministry, but you're afraid of change. I know the older we get, the more we're afraid of change. You know, people get ready to retire from one job. It may be that God's fixing to refire them in ministry somewhere else or something. And and there's always some fears in there. But what is it in your life that's stopping you from accomplishing the things that God is calling you to accomplish? And whatever that is, get it out of the way. Because God knows better than you do how He wants to use you in ministry. And then the other question is this, and I ask this to everybody. Is God calling you, and here the me is not me, the me is you. Is God calling you to some kind of full-time Christian service? If he is, that means you've got to pull up your stakes and move and go somewhere else. When God called me, I told him I'd go to Africa and work with children. I couldn't think of two things worse than that. But he sent me six miles up the road from my own hometown to which I love with all my heart so that I can minister to a lot of you that I've known all my life. But my question is, is he doing the same thing with some of you? You know, I look back across my ministry at Ridgely, and I I really feel bad that we hadn't had more missionaries leave out of here to go to a foreign mission field. I wonder, have I not preached the word right? You know, I wonder why we hadn't more. We've had a few pastors come out. We've had a few children's directors and things come out of us, but really and truly it seems like a church our size that has an effect on about five, anywhere from 500 to 800 people in any given month would have more people stepping off into the deep end and going where God has called them to go. So I guess maybe what I'm doing tonight is just giving you a shove and saying if God called you, go. Now, I'm not one of these that believes in twisting arms and having 45-minute invitations until somebody comes, and when somebody comes and when, uh, we see nobody else is coming, we'll quit the invitation. Because I think before anybody goes into full-time Christian ministry, they need to consider the cost because it will cost them a lot. It will cost them their health. It will cost them financially. It will cost them emotionally. But in time, you will rejoice for what the Lord has done in you. So if God is calling you, don't necessarily come down the aisle tonight, but come when you're ready. Come when you know that God has called you. You might be like me. I said, Lord, I want to call like everybody else has. I want you to strike me with a bolt of lightning and tell me that you're calling me in the ministry. I want to know that you have called. Lord, why don't you just speak and call in the ministry? And, and I thought to myself, I just open up my Bible and look at it. I flip my Bible open, let it open in the book of John in there. And it, I read down there, it says, you wicked uh, people. He was talking to the Pharisees. I will not give you a sign. I surrendered to the ministry the next week. <laughs> Sometimes he just wants you to dive off in the deep end. Lord God in heaven, help us to be who you want us to be.